finally, we found someone more obsessive compulsive about watching their carbon footprint than you, Dad. I thought I had the crown. But Lloyd Alter, editor of the Daily Tree Hugger newsletter and author of Living the One and a Half Degree Lifestyle, has me beat hands down. Yep, Lloyd did the hard work for us, so we don't have to. What matters most in the lifestyle choices we all make if we want to do our part to keep the climate crisis from being a bigger disaster than it has to be? Next. Calling, 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 calling. Call a growth buster. Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. Welcome to the Growth Busters podcast, where we discuss our society's addiction to growth and we do our best to chart a sustainable course for human civilization. I'm Dave Gardner, director of the documentary Growth Busters Hooked on Growth and founder and chief scientist at the Institute for Advanced Growth Addiction Studies. And I'm Stephanie Gardner, Growth Busters board member, environmental law and policy wonk and sustainable energy enthusiast. You'll find us at growthbusters.org. Search for Growth Busters on Facebook, Twitter, and of course, your podcast app for the latest growth busting news. In our last episode, we talked with Lloyd Alter about why try to live that one and a half degree lifestyle. Can your actions really make a difference? And we just didn't get all the way through. We certainly didn't get into the nitty gritty, which we're going to do in this episode. But before we start, a quick reminder that one and a half degrees refers to the goal of keeping the global average temperature rise to no more than one and a half degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial average. Now, you got to nearly double that to get the degrees in Fahrenheit. The goal is to keep the temperature increase to no more than 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this is going to be a long episode, uh, over an hour, because there's so much to talk about with Lloyd, but you don't want to miss a second of it. So let's bring in Lloyd Alter to continue the conversation. Lloyd is a writer, public speaker, and former architect and developer. He's based in Toronto, Canada. He's published over 14,000 articles on Tree Hugger, which is an online uh, news resource with lots of environmental-focused articles. He's the former managing editor of Tree Hugger and currently edits the Daily Newsletter. And he recently wrote this book, Living the 1.5 Degree Lifestyle, Why Individual Climate Action Matters More Than Ever, that we started digging into last episode and we're going to pick that back up for this episode as well. Lloyd, I can't thank you enough for joining us again to continue the conversation that we really enjoyed in the last episode, but there was so much more to cover. Happy to be here again. I enjoyed it too. That's great. As you know, you wrote uh, Living the One and a Half Degree Lifestyle to recount uh, your experience with it and how you've proven to yourself that you can do it. But the book is really chock full of really great ideas and some pretty insightful analysis about what tactics are more effective than others. And so we're reconvening today primarily to kind of get the highlights from you from each of those categories about, you know, what you found to be the most valuable lifestyle changes. Yes. So should we start with what we eat? Sure. That's actually one of my favorite because it's one of the most uh, I won't say counterintuitive, but it's not what people think. The traditional thing that people think is, and you see on all the websites is, oh, you've got to go vegan or at least vegetarian. And the thing about vegetarianism in particular is vegetarians are allowed to eat dairy and cheese. And cheese comes from milk and milk comes from cows and sheep, which are ruminants. So in fact, cheese has a really, really high carbon footprint. That explains why it tastes so great, huh? Yes, absolutely. (laughs) I mean, red meat is absolutely the worst. Red meat steaks are off the scale in terms of carbon footprint of the meat because the cows live a long time. They eat a lot of grain that has got a carbon footprint of its own. They burp and fart out methane gas as part of their digestive system, which is a very big greenhouse gas, important greenhouse gas. And so they're the worst. Pigs, having pork, though, is half of what it is having red meat. And then you start looking closely and you get some bizarre surprises like shrimp. Shrimp are right up there. They're the next worst thing after red meat because they're all dredged out of the water in Thailand and places like there, and they travel a huge amount of distance for processing and then shipping. 
But then it gets really funny. Well, people say, well, I'll be vegan and I'm just going to eat vegetable stuff, but they eat vegetables year round. The next worst thing after shrimp are pretty high up there anyway are tomatoes, because for most of the world, they're only in field tomatoes for a short season, and the rest of the time, they're hothouse tomatoes, which are grown under glass using natural gas to heat the thing. So that you can't say you're a vegetarian or a vegan. You have to start thinking like a climatarian. You have to start looking at every food in terms of what its particular footprint is. Now, going vegan is still the best if you are willing to keep away from anything that's flown in. My mother was the best example of that. The woman grew up in the Depression and then in the 50s with canned food. And she just thought that fresh asparagus in the middle of winter was the most <laughs> wonderful thing that mankind ever produced. And she would sit there in the middle of winter. I'd say, Mom, this is flown in from Peru. You can't do this. And she just says, isn't it wonderful that we can live like this? You have no idea what it was like when I was a kid. And even when you were a kid, when we were eating canned asparagus instead of fresh, she just could never get over the wonders of technology between the refrigeration and the transport. And we've all become really spoiled this way. We just expect things all the time, uh, whatever the season. Now, what we learned in doing this, and also in a previous exercise my wife did when we, she was a food writer, is that if you eat seasonal food, it's better. I mean, I can get a tasteless California strawberry now uh, that's shipped all the way and really tastes like nothing. But in two months, when I eat that first strawberry of the year that comes out of the ground, the first Ontario Canada strawberry, it'll probably be three months. It's like nothing you've ever tasted. And the same when you first hit the fresh asparagus, everything tastes better, A, because it's fresh, and B, you've been waiting for it. <laughs> and uh, so just the seasonal diet just tastes better like that. So eliminating meat and eating seasonally is critically important. A lot of studies say that the transport isn't a big deal. It's a small part of it. And I actually spent a lot of time looking into the research and the research on transport just calculated the diesel fuel that it took to drive the truck. Mm -hmm. It didn't calculate the diesel, the energy that it was to run the refrigeration unit, which is running all the time. And it didn't account for the leakage of refrigerant, which is a huge greenhouse gas and a huge problem, which is equal to half of the energy. But you managed to find data on that. Yes. But the studies that the food people used just didn't use this data. So anyhow, I was able to dig into that and basically develop what I was not the first to call this climatarian diet, which for me was no red meat. And the other thing that we all have to consider is portion size, that we basically waste 40% of all the food that's picked. And there's a carbon footprint of growing food, but we also waste a lot of food by eating portions that are twice as big as they were when we were kids or when our parents served us. If you look in restaurants, if you look at everything, it's what one writer called portion distortion. Because food as relation to income became so much cheaper, we just start eating so much more of it. And so we're either wasting it by putting food in the garbage or we're wasting it by putting food in the toilet because we're eating so much more than we need. So we tried very hard to eat everything, no leftovers, uh, uh, eating all our leftovers, I mean, portion size, putting it out there so you don't have out there more than you should have, more than you need, and being careful what we buy in the first place. And you can cut your carbon footprint from food in half. The other thing I did that's interesting is that I did a study of our favorite takeout food, which is a rotisserie chicken that's very popular here. And I'd stopped buying it years ago because it came in all this plastic and I couldn't stand the waste of all the plastic. And then I weighed the plastic. I said, oh, that's six grams of carbon for a gram of plastic. That's 200 grams, okay, for the plastic. And then I looked at the chicken and I didn't have good data on what it takes to raise a chicken. And I went into the engineering catalogs to find out how much gas was used to run the rotisserie. 
to try and figure out what was the real carbon footprint of me ordering in rotisserie chicken. And I go from everywhere, literally from the chicken barn, through the truck, to the kitchen, to the rotisserie thing, to the plastic. And what do I find? The delivery guy driving the four miles from the chicken joint to my house was twice everything else put together. Wow. Wow. (laughs) So, you know, if you're getting a DoorDash or whatever the systems are that come by bicycle, it's a different story. But, you know, most of our deliveries still come with a guy in a car and he's not driving a Tesla. And uh, so just ordering in became one of the biggest carbon footprint things. And we basically kind of stopped doing that, Mm -hmm. do it a lot less. And of course, there's tons of plastic, but the plastic isn't the real killer. It's the transportation. Pretty interesting. So I think one of the pieces of advice in the book, I think you recommended, well, get on your bike and ride over to pick up the takeout. Exactly. Of course, that's the big convenience, of course. You don't have to cook and you don't need to get your bike. But um, we just do it a lot less than we used to. Yeah, I think that's an important message, especially it, se- it seems like there's this huge takeout culture since COVID yeah. happened. And, you know, pe- I think people are saying it's not going away anytime soon. And I was always personally so focused on just the containers and, you know, all of the waste of the packaging and stuff. But I hadn't even really thought about the car miles. You know, and I'm really working hard now to train myself to uh, to really look at uh, if, if I'm tempted by a great sale on uh, berries, blackberries or blueberries or something like that. Typically here in Colorado, we really have to rely on the West Coast to get good berries. And those are good. Uh, I hate to deal with that transportation. But I try to now train myself to watch for chili is a pretty common source of some of these. Right. And, and uh, you know, I just don't want that transportation footprint. Plus, they never taste as good. Right. They're just too long from the field. Yeah. The only other thing that was really new to me was the food waste part, like the the food that's left in the fields and then thinking about what's left in people's refrigerators or, or food that people let go bad. Right. There's this uh, excess, right? Like because food is cheap and we can get it cheaply because fossil fuels are cheap, it doesn't matter if you throw away extra food and people just don't think about how that adds up over time. The silliest example of all of this is lettuce. Uh, lettuce is wasted and thrown out more than any other food because you put it in the crisper and it just gets soggy and rotten and gets thrown out. And lettuce is 96% water. And so, you know, they're picking the lettuce in California and they're putting it in a truck and they're shipping basically refrigerated water across the country to your house. And that's what you're buying is water. And half of it gets rotted in the fridge anyway. I highly recommend for your uh, amusement, there's a website called lettuceisstupid.com. And you type that in and it just one little thing comes up on the screen saying it really is. And that's the whole website. (laughs) Like, (laughs) it's right. It's absolutely correct. Well, shoot. So we try to keep away from the romaine and the iceberg in the winter as well, just because of that. It's it's ridiculous, the cost of getting it and what it actually is, which is water with a little bit of cells around it. Well, aren't some of those leafy greens are good for you if you can grow them in your backyard or get them at the local farmer's market in the season, right? Yes. And a lot of uh, people are growing sprouts and other things hydroponically under LED lights now. I'd love to see the real footprint of all the power it takes to do that stuff. But um, there are alternatives. Kale also. I got totally sick of kale because kale grows right into the uh, winter that I can barely look at kale anymore. But it's a choice (laughs) that it's nutritionally dense and you can almost grow it all year. One last note about the portion distortion. You know, I'm tempted to say we ought to uh, form a movement to try to get restaurants to really reduce the portion sizes. But I've come up with my version of that, which is I just you know, carry a leftover container with me when I go to the local restaurant. And I just plan on eating half of what they serve me and bringing the rest home. 
I do that too. I can't eat those portions. But, you know, you have to look at what happened over the years. It used to be if you wanted a coffee and a snack, you went into a coffee shop and you sat down and got it in a refillable container. And you sat there and drank your coffee. So they gave you a five-ounce coffee because they didn't want you occupying the real estate for that long. <laughs> they wanted you to drink the coffee and get out. And as soon as they outsourced the seating to us where we sit in our car and we carry it around, it costs them very little to just cram the size is up to where you know you're now getting like a what's a big gulp of pop with the you know a giant thing of coffee and you can't even get a small one at Starbucks anymore you know they start <laughs> with the medium and they just upsize and upsize and upsize because you're the real estate you know you got your car seat and you got your cup holder and we now feel we have to drive around drinking coffee instead of sitting down and this is uh, this whole thing that started in the 50s with takeout food has just increased the carbon footprint of eating so dramatically because we're driving around to get it and, of course, all the waste from it. Yeah, we've got all these Dutch Brothers uh, little coffee stations around town and all day long. I mean, no matter what time of day, there is a line of cars waiting to get the coffee. I don't know whether it's that good. I've never done it or whether it's just so easy to drive through. But I just hate to see all those engines just idling while there's 12 cars in line waiting to get that oversized coffee. And they're all big pickup trucks and SUVs now, too. It's just it's just just crazy. Madness. Well, I've never heard of the term climatarian before. I'm surprised I haven't, but I'm looking forward to using that moving forward because I feel like that will start some really interesting conversations <laughs> the next time I'm asked about my dietary restrictions. <laughs> yeah, it's it's new. It's relatively rare. I actually thought this woman who was in charge of environmental stuff for a New York City salad chain invented it. And she said, no, this other person did. So it's new, but I think it's going to be come into much more common use. Cool. Yeah. One last thing on this topic before we move on is, and because I, I think it relates to the next topic, you mentioned ammonia production for fertilizers being a huge source of carbon emissions. And do you mind telling us a little bit about that? Well, it's ammonia is made in this Haber-Bosch system process, it's called, that basically it's made from hydrogen. And the hydrogen is made from natural gas through a process called steam reformation. And so to make the hydrogen, they basically take natural gas and they separate the carbon dioxide from it, the carbon, and turn it into carbon dioxide. And then they feed the hydrogen into the plant to make ammonia. And I forget the number. I think it's 4% of the world's carbon emissions now come from uh, making this. Now, they're talking in the future, we'll have green hydrogen that's made from electrolysis, and they're talking about carbon capture and storage. But basically, the fertilizers that made the green revolution possible, that let us feed the world that we have, basically is almost all made from natural gas. Yeah. So that's the problem. There's a carbon footprint to almost everything that we eat, even if it's a vegetable, if it's been grown with all that fertilizer. And it's another reason, that's the main reason we have to reduce waste in the field. We have to, should be reducing waste in the fridge, because it's all going back, it's all basically going back and being a fossil fuel. Fertilizer also is grossly overused. It's not properly managed. It's spread on too thick. It runs off into our waterways and contaminates them. So they're all problematic for many reasons. Yeah. So essentially, we're using a lot of fossil fuels to grow our food, transport our food. We're eating too much of that food. And then we're not even recapturing a lot of that kind of beneficial fertilizer on the other end. And this is where it relates to the next topic we were going to talk about, which is how we live. Right. And one thing I loved about your book, Lloyd, was that you, you know, you're, you're really into data, but you're also a little bit of a historian because you give us the backstory of how we got to where we are. And, and, you know, in the, in the how we live section, you, you talk a lot about how treatment of waste running water, how all those systems have changed over the centuries to give us the current system today and how inefficient that is. Right. And one of the best examples that you were just alluding to there is our toilets, that uh, basically we use drinking water to um, 
flush our waste away and often into places where we're getting our drinking water. <laughs> and when they were arguing about this in the middle of the 19th century, there were big fights about this among all the engineers, that there was one school of thought saying that um, we have to gather the poop and we have to use it all as fertilizer, that it's good fertilizer, it's manure, we're wasting it. And there was the other guy that the theory was, oh, when you put it in the water, dilution, water cleans itself. The solution to pollution is dilution. So if you throw it all in the, in the water, uh, it dilutes enough that it's all fine. And hopefully you're putting it into a river that runs downstream or into an ocean and you're getting your drinking water from somewhere else. But they're always getting intermixed and contaminated. This is how we've got the development of our sewers came after they figured that out in 1854 in London, where, you know, people were getting their water out of the pump here and they were having all their crap go into a big cistern just a few feet away and they were leaking together and it was killing everyone. And so then they developed the first sewer system in Philadelphia where they put in all of these wooden pipes and shipped it right into the river. And it all happened ever since. The toilet was a total accident. This is my favorite story. <laughs> you know, the toilet was invented in the 15th century. And after that pump handle, after they discovered about the problem with the cholera from the contaminated water, they started putting pipes into everybody's house. And previously, you know, you took a bucket of water in and you threw a bucket out into the street and the system was all in balance and the wastewater would go down a gutter in the middle of the road. As soon as people had all this water, they said, well, we can hook it up to toilets and we can wash the waste away. And so instantly the streets were full and then the rivers were full and then there were like channels. And, you know, the Thames River, they couldn't go to Parliament. They had to close Parliament because the smell of the river was so strong that they couldn't work. And so that's when they started building sewers to divert around the Thames. That's why in Philadelphia and New York, they started building sewers because the water came first and the toilet was like an accident. The toilet was, oh, gee, we have water. Now we can wash all the waste away. And um, we've been living with that accident ever since. Now, some people say we should all, in some, they've tried in Sweden and in China using vacuum toilets that actually go and suck it all away where they can separate the urine and the poop and use them both, get phosphorus from one, nitrogen from the other. Other people have experimented with composting toilets in office buildings, like the greenest building in the States was the Bullet Center, which was a six-story office building in Seattle. And they had composting toilets in the entire building for the first eight years of its life. And then just last year, they pulled them out. They finally gave up. They couldn't keep up with the cleaning of them. People really are used to having a nice big lake of water under their bum when they go to the bathroom. <laughs> and even though it's the sweetest smelling bathroom I've ever been in because they're all under negative pressure, sucking air down through the pipe in the bowl. So there's never a smell in the bathroom of any kind, hmm. except when they did service. Suddenly the whole floor <laughs> would smell and they went and turned off the fan for service. So they had all kinds of problems. The biggest problem they had was because there were only six composting toilets in one building, there was no real infrastructure for picking the stuff up and for getting it out to where uh, it would go through its second stage of composting out in the countries nearby. You know, in England, in England 300 years ago, they had night soil guys who would come with their carts and take it all away. There was an established infrastructure in Shanghai 150 years ago. There was a canal network, and you'd go and you'd leave your poop out in a terracotta jar, and they'd leave you an empty terracotta jar, and they'd put it in their little pontoon, I don't know, they're almost like gondolas where they pulled their way out to the countryside and use it in manure. In Japan, they would pay you for it because it was such good fertilizer. And of course, the rich, because they eat richer and better meals, got more money for their poop than the poor people did, with, you know, usual inequity in the system. But there was a structure, a circular structure of you eat the food, you poop it out, it gets picked up, it gets taken away, it gets put in the fields, and you grow the food. 
and it was like a closed circle that dealt with it all. Of course, today, if you tried that, we've got drugs, we've got antibiotics, we've got all kinds of other things that, you you know, you don't want to put it on the field anymore unless you, uh, for at least the vegetables we want to eat, although many cities do get biosolids, which are processed from the waste that comes out of sewage treatment plants. So we're still doing it to a degree. It's just much more elaborate because we have to now separate it from the water and process it and do all that. And that treatment part also has a carbon footprint. Oh, yes, yes. And pumping the water up the hill to the water tower is a huge, huge user of electricity. I was shocked to find that after street lighting, the single biggest cost to civic governments was the electricity to run the water pumping systems. Wow. Wow. So it's a big deal. You know, and we're kind of undergoing this mass urbanization right now. And I think waste management is probably the one area, at least the human waste, where, I mean, the more of us that we pack into these smaller areas, the more technological solutions we have to pursue. Yes. Which rarely beats Mother Nature. Yeah. And in most coastal cities around the world, even in countries like the United States and Canada, if they're on the ocean, they're still pumping so much of it straight into the ocean without any processing at all. And this has to stop. Well, let's talk because you're an architect by training. I think you had some pretty interesting things to talk about regarding uh, you know, our homes. So shall we move into that? Yeah. And I think the main thing to talk about our homes is that We've got this North American obsession with the single family home, which is on a big lot that most people have to drive to. And it's got four outside walls and a roof, and it's got a connection to the ground and the foundation. And that just means that to heat or to cool it consumes a huge amount of energy. If you compare the carbon footprint of someone living in suburban North America to the carbon footprint of someone living in Vienna, say, a very civilized city where people, I think, on the happiness index are among the happiest in the world, but there they have no single family houses. Everybody raises their family in an apartment, which means... You only have one or maybe two walls to the outside and the rest you're not losing heat or gaining heat through because you're sharing them with a neighbor. And so the carbon footprint of someone in Vienna, even after eating all of their fabulous fried meats um, and everything that they do, and even though a lot of them have cars, which they use on weekends, but their carbon footprint is less than half of a North American, simply because they live in smaller spaces and they live in the kinds of neighborhoods that were designed so that they have great transportation right outside their door. Like I went to see this development when I was last there two years ago, which basically was a former airfield. They're lucky. They have lots of former airfields. And before they built the whole new development, they rammed the subway through to it so that as soon as people moved in, they would have transport. And all of the buildings are six stories to eight stories high, and their families and their daycare centers and their pools, and they just build everything together so that you have everything you need all at once. Whereas in North America, what do we do? We just keep ramming houses out into the suburbs, and you've got to get in your car and drive five miles back to get to the grocery store to get your quart of milk. And so it's a very, very high carbon lifestyle. Now, what I did, the only way I was able to get through it, I live in what was a single family house in a, built in 1913 in what's a streetcar suburb like you have in Boston and a lot of other cities where they built the streetcars and then they built fairly dense housing around walking distance to the streetcar. And what I did six years ago now when I wanted to sell because my kids had grown up and I wanted to live in a smaller space, my wife didn't want to sell, so we duplexed the house. We cut it in half. I live on the ground floor and the lower level, which I'm in right now, and we rented upstairs, in fact, to my daughter and her husband. So we've got two and a half times as many people living in the house. So our per capita consumption of water and of energy and everything else went down. And we're very happily, the two of us living in 1,200 square feet. And so this is key to 
living, just having smaller spaces and sharing surfaces is key. And this is why we have to encourage the duplexing and the triplexing of existing houses and new mid-density construction, not the high-density construction, but like what you're seeing a lot of, I think you're seeing a lot of this in um, where you live in Colorado, where they build sort of low-rise apartment buildings on top of a podium on the ground floor. And that's a style of building people say they hate, but, I, you know, it's really efficient. Yeah. And it's almost affordable. One thing that you wrote about, Lloyd, was that the so electrification is a key part of what we need to be doing with our building stock. And you said that the electric mix is going to just get greener and greener over time. Yes. And we're seeing that evolution. It's not going fast enough, but we're seeing that. And you said the gas grid is not going to get greener. <laughs> which is, duh, obvious. So a lot of homes are still heated with gas. A lot of homes cook with gas. But there are some really great technologies, air source heat pumps, conduction stoves, uh, that kind of thing that we really all need to be switching over Yeah, when it makes sense to replace an appliance. Yeah, the technological change in the last decade, some of them have been absolutely remarkable. For instance, just LED bulbs, just our lighting. If you change bulb for bulb, what you had before from uh, incandescent or the compact, then the compact to LEDs, you've dropped your power consumption to a tenth. What I'm finding now is that People are putting in way more fixtures. I just saw a picture of a house in Florida that the whole dining room ceiling was a grid of LED fixtures. Of course, we're seeing outside of buildings getting all lit up and covered with screens. We're seeing LED billboards. We're seeing what is called Jivon's paradox, that basically when things get more efficient, you use more of them. It's why as cars got more efficient, we got SUVs, and why houses got bigger when they got in insulated because that's what you do. But with LEDs, it's a technological revolution, an explosion, such a magnitude of energy efficiency that we're seeing them used in ways that we never had before. We're seeing, I've seen carpets with them embedded in them, wallpapers, uh, TVs have gotten huge. We have to watch this. We have to watch the fact that we're saying, oh, LEDs are so much more efficient because if we buy 10 times as many of them, we haven't done anything. And I'm seeing that sometimes. I'm seeing light levels from space. I was talking to someone, an astronomer who's big on night sky stuff, and he says the amount of sky brightness because of the change to LEDs is just going up by huge magnitudes. So this is the principle I call that the whole book about is sufficiency. The, not just efficiency, but sufficiency. What is enough? What do you need? How many LED bulbs do you need? That's a major question. Change the ones you had. Don't buy 12 more fixtures. The other thing we have to watch for is the trend to smart everything. Everybody says, oh, smart technology is going to save us energy because it'll turn off and on the lights. But of course, now that the lights are so efficient, what happens is what happened in my dining room where I replaced, I put in three smart Philips Hue bulbs. And we sit at the dining room table for about an hour a day, let's say. So the other 23 hours, those light bulbs are trickling a little bit of power because they're talking to the controller, which is talking to the internet. And I found a source of how much is that power trickling all day long? And it turns out my three smart bulbs are using more electricity when they're off than when they're on. That in the 23 hours of them just talking to the controller, waiting for me to turn them on and off with my smartphone, they're sipping all that electricity. So anyone who tells you, oh, we've got a smart light bulb and it's saving me money because I can turn it on and off with my phone. I prefer dumb tech. Get up, turn off the light. <laughs> I like dumb houses that have lots of insulation instead of smart thermostats. In a well-insulated dumb house, a smart thermostat is bored stupid. It has nothing to do because the temperature doesn't change. So, you know, go for the basic things and... I've known people who rip the smart thermostats out of the wall because there's three people in the house and it gets confused. It doesn't know who to follow and what to do. So all of this technology is just sort of Silicon Valley looking for some way to take your money, but it doesn't save any energy. It just costs it. 
Yeah, and especially when you have to consider the upfront carbon emissions to the embodied energy of making a lot of these changes. Yes. Now, those are the two most important words. I guess we have to talk about that because people just don't understand it very well at all. But embodied carbon, what this is, I don't like the term. I've always said it's a horrible name because people think, oh, the carbon's in it. The carbon's not embodied in it. The carbon's in the air. It's the big burp of carbon for making the thing. So I actually started using the term upfront carbon. And it's now getting traction and being used in the building industry. Oh, very good. As the carbon that is emitted before a building is occupied. And I'm getting a little bit off topic by talking about my cell phone, but you raised embodied carbon. And um, so I'm just going to talk about it now because embodied carbon's in everything. If you buy a dishwasher, people say, oh, dishwashing is by, with a dishwasher is more efficient than washing by hand. And when you look at the water energy consumption in that, but when you add in 100 pounds of steel and aluminum and plastic that the dishwasher's made of, the equation changes, mm. which is why you should buy the best quality you can buy of things that will last the longest time. I mean, just look who's got the most dependable washing machines. If it's Whirlpool, buy the Whirlpool, because every year that you keep that thing going drops the embodied carbon proportion of it, the upfront carbon. It's divided over the life of it. It gets better. This phone that weighs half a kilogram, weighs like eight ounces, it has... Embodied carbon, according to Apple, the total amount of carbon released in the manufacture of that phone of 80 kilograms. Now, you and I couldn't lift 80 kilograms if we tried, probably. And yet that's the weight of the carbon dioxide emitted making this phone, according to Apple calculations. And I, an Apple fanboy to the nth degree. I've got my watch. I've got my AirPods. I've got my MacBook Pro. I've got my iPad. I've got all this. And I put them all up in a stack and totaled up the carbon footprint of it, divided it by the life that Apple uses in their calculations. They say these phones last an average of this, that average is a lot like that. And the carbon of my Apple collection was the second highest thing in my spreadsheet after natural gas. And that was just, to me, the most mind-blowing thing. Yeah, so what I've decided now is, well, I'm stuck with that number 11 phone, even if Apple gets up to 18, as long as it works. I'm going to keep this stuff going as long as possible. And every year that you keep something going reduces its carbon footprint by that much. Because these things take no electricity to run. They sip electricity. That's designed to run that way. But to make them a lot of carbon. So if you're really trying to be very conscientious about your footprint, there's two things I think really important from this. One is, of course, going for durable products that will last a long time uh, because the manufacturer of a replacement has a, such a huge footprint. And then I think the other is it complicates the decision just about replacing, you know, like, you know, you're thinking, okay, we're going to sell our gas guzzling automobile and get an electric car. Well, there's the upfront carbon emissions from the vehicle that you're thinking about disposing of. And it may not be, the calculus may be that you're actually keeping your footprint smaller by keeping a car that's less efficient. You'd hate to admit that. Depending on how much you drive, that's absolutely true. Yeah. We drive very, very little because we live in the city and everything is so close. And we only put, I guess, about 5,000 miles onto our car every year with my wife doing the driving. I don't drive anymore at all. And when you figure out the carbon footprint of, say, me replacing that with a Tesla with its 15 tons of upfront carbon... I mean, there's no comparison whatsoever. I mean, this car was built when, you know, a small car, eight tons to make it. And then we're burning hardly any carbon because we barely drive it. And with gas prices, what they are right now, we're going to drive it even less. Yeah. So the 1.5 degree lifestyle, as a reminder, that leaves you a 2.5 ton lifestyle emissions budget, 2.5 tons per year. Right. So if you go out and buy a Tesla and it's 15 tons... You have to have that car for, I guess, more than seven or eight years 
just for the upfront carbon emissions. Yes. So that's your entire budget for eight years of your life. Yeah, you have to have no other carbon emissions. To... Right. Yeah, you can't eat, you can't have shelter. Maybe you could shelter in the Tesla. <laughs> Fortunately, these electric cars are going to last a really long time because they're so much simpler and their carbon footprint is going down all the time. You know, they work, it's money. Most of this is in the battery and they're making the batteries so much more efficient. I wrote an article uh, about a year ago that was very controversial where I did the math and figured that buying a little Honda that ran on gas had a lower carbon footprint than buying a Ford F-150 electric pickup truck because of its huge upfront carbon of making it. And the head of our company even sent a note, you know, I now work for the largest English language publishing company in the world. And he read that and he got really mad. We're supposed to be promoting electric cars. How can you do this? You know, how can you be saying a gasoline car is better than an electric? And I said, well, I'm measuring a Honda Fit, which they don't even sell in the States anymore because nobody wanted, against a, a Ford pickup. And you look at the numbers and it's better. Well, a new study, I had to write another article last week where a new study came out with reputable numbers, I went through all the backup that said that that Ford F-150 pickup truck that I said was 40 tons of upfront carbon is only 17 tons of upfront carbon. I was off by more than twice. Now, that changes everything. But one of the things that you find in the whole thing, whether you're talking chickens or tomatoes or cars, is that the numbers are wonky and wild and nobody actually knows precisely what it is. Like Apple did the most detailed calculations that I'd seen yet to come up with their estimates, but everything we're doing is still a guess. What we need is a label on everything like you do a nutrition label to see how many calories and how many vitamins that the companies that make these things know what goes into them. They could put a label on it and tell you how much carbon it is like Apple does. But the car manufacturers aren't going to do that. They want you to get a bigger car. They want you, even if it's an electric, they want you to buy a big one. Yeah. And and then the other part here is it goes to show even if a Ford F-150 electric vehicle is 17 tons instead of 40 tons, it still shows us that we can't all just switch to EVs and magically our carbon problem goes away because of all the carbon that needs to be emitted to produce enough vehicles to interchange them all. Well, look at, and also the numbers change all the time. Look at what happened just this week. Russia, because it has lots of hydropower, is responsible for 30% of the so-called green aluminum that's made with hydroelectricity instead of coal. Uh, as And uh, so it's responsible for 30% of it. Uh, Ford, a lot of companies pay a premium to get green aluminum to reduce their carbon footprint. And everybody stopped buying Russian aluminum. And where do they have to go instead? To China, mm. where it's coal fired and the aluminum is five times the carbon footprint of Russian aluminum made with hydropower. So if you're buying something now, not only do you have to worry about, you know, this aluminum pan is it Chinese aluminum versus Russian aluminum? There's no way to know these things. So. The answer is to live where there's public transit and you can bike to where you need to go. <laughs> exactly. I was just going to say, the answer is to buy a bike and use your old cast iron frying pan. There you go. Since we've kind of segued into vehicles, to further complicate the decision process, you know, electric motors are, what, two to four times more efficient than internal combustion engines. Oh, way more than that. I think More than that? Yeah, the numbers I was reading that, you know, just because of the energy it takes to move a car, 16% of the energy from gasoline gets changed into forward movement, whereas in an electric car, 85% of the energy wow. gets transmitted into forward motion. So it's like way, way more. It's why when we convert to electric cars, it won't be as hard to find the electricity as we think because they're batteries, they can store it at night, and they use it so efficiently. But still, smaller is better, and lighter is better, and we shouldn't be getting these big vehicles. We should be lightweighting everything, and we should have little cars. It's just ridiculous, these things that are out there now. The erased, now that we've segued into transportation, I'd like to point out one of my biggest revelations from writing the book. 
which is, you know, people say, oh, you have this much carbon from transportation and there's this much carbon from housing. But in fact, what I found and realized and what I found from other people is that they're the same thing in different languages. We get our suburbs because we have cars. If we didn't have, if we didn't have the car, then we never would have built the car-dependent <laughs> suburb. So as soon as you change your lifestyle to like where you're living, suddenly you're not using your car in the way you were. And so it's very hard to separate the two. It's, it comes down to a lifestyle choice that you've made. If I live in a place where I need a car, my carbon footprint's going to be really high. Now, I think that we're on the cusp of a revolution with e-bikes, which will let people of different degrees of fitness travel in different kinds of weather and different kinds of hilly environments, and most importantly, longer distance without the work, mm -hmm. so that we might see a reduction in the number of cars in the suburbs and an increase in the number of people riding bikes, e-bikes. And it's much easier to put in protected bike infrastructure in the suburbs where the road allowances are much wider. So I'm hoping we'll see a revolution in that and that maybe the suburbs can be made to work because 74% of Americans live in what are classed as suburbs. They're not in the core of the city and they're not rural. They're in that sort of car-dominated suburban environment. And that's going to be the hardest nut to crack. What do we do with their houses? Well, now we have that other great technological revolution of the last decade, which is air source heat pumps that actually work at low temperature. Uh, used to be heat pumps started losing all of their effectiveness in cold weather. So the, by the time you got into straight winter, you were like straight running resistance heat. And they've gotten better and better and better to where now they work effectively at down to zero Fahrenheit pretty effectively. And people are installing them in Colorado without backup electric toaster coils and things like that. And what happens over time is as the grid gets cleaner and as we get the heat pumps in there, like five years ago, I used to write, every house has to be renovated to almost passive house standard where you have a foot of insulation and you do this and you do that to make the house not use any energy. But that's very expensive and we can't do that to every house in America. What we can do is we can seal them. We can get in there with caulk because 30% of your heat loss is lost through leakage. So we can seal them, which cuts your heat loss by 30%. We can fix the basements and the attics. And you do that. And it's the old 80% rule, you know, the 80% is relatively easy to do. Yeah. And go in there and do the simple things and the cheap things, and then make up the difference with a heat pump. This is the way we're going to get through this, not super insulating every existing house. I just loved what you wrote about e-bikes. So I want to just revisit that for a moment. You shared a really great statistic about uh, how people's behavior changed when they switched from, uh, I think, from just from a regular bicycle to an e-bike. Do you remember that? I remember that there were studies that showed that they were going uh, twice as far. There was an English study yeah. that found that people were using them again in the suburbs that they never did, that they were going twice as far. There are Dutch studies where every second bike now sold is an e-bike, where people are using the trains less, biking much further, biking much older. When e-bikes started about... The real e-bike start, boom started in North America a few years ago. They were sold to two groups. They were sold to aging boomers and they were sold to delivery guys. And for regular people who rode bikes, oh no, that that's cheating. The word was that's cheating. You have an e-bike, you're not really biking. <laughs> to which everybody's finally coming. Oh, and it was hard to buy them, especially if you were a woman. Uh, you would go into the bike shops and they were all these misogynist sort of bike racers who just didn't want to sell an e-bike to a woman. They were horrible, which is why Rad Bikes and other companies that started up internet sales actually did really well. And What's happened just in the last few years is new bike shops have opened. People have gotten smart. They've gotten rid of the creeps. Uh, so you go to the specialty bike shop for the racers over there now. A real market has opened and more and more people are doing it. And, you know, I think with the gas prices, with what's happening right now, 
I would be shocked if a lot of people weren't saying, you know, if I had that bike, I could save a lot of money. I did a tweet on the weekend that got a lot of people cranky with me where I was going to buy some stuff. And I took a picture of the gas station with the price. I said, wow, I'm so shocked. I just e-biked past the gas station and the gas is twice the price I paid when I last filled the tank two years ago. (laughs) It is life changing in that sense. And a lot of people are doing it. And the e-bikes are getting better and cheaper, just like the electric cars are really. We can't move on from transportation unless we touch on air travel. Oh, I know. This was one area that I just, I found your statistics absolutely shocking. Um, And it made me come face to face with my own privilege and my own carbon footprint. But you, you you basically highlight that uh, 80% of people on the planet have never been on a plane. That air travel is really for the wealthiest people in the world. Yes. Yeah, this is the thing. You know, the airplanes companies all say, oh, airplane travel isn't a big deal. It's only 2% of emissions. So what are you complaining about? Well, first of all, it's not 2% of emissions. They're lying. That's just the fuel. But there's also this thing called radiative forcing. It has a climate effect that is about double. Then there's, of course, building the airports and building the parking garage and servicing all the infrastructure and that. Yeah. And really, when you put it all together, it's close to 6%. And as you say, it's a very, very small percentage of the population, most of whom might get on a plane once a year. I would say all of us here in this room are maybe in the top 10%, but the top 1%, 40% of their personal carbon footprints, which in the United States is up at about 60 tons per year, 40% of their emissions are just from their flying. You know, we're going off in the weekend here, off in the weekend there. And we're in a big continent and the trains are terrible. And if you want to get anywhere here, it's almost like you don't have a choice. I went to visit head office by train uh, about 10 years ago to try it out because you could get a train from Toronto to New York City. And it took 14 hours to get there. It takes eight hours to drive. At the border, I was treated like a criminal because I, they must think that anyone who's taking the train has something to hide or they'd be in the airplane. But it was like two hours to cross the border at Buffalo. You know, you go to Europe or you go to China and you get in the train and you're just whooshing at 200 miles an hour. And it's just so fantastic. We so desperately need that in North America. The last time I took a train... In Canada, I mean, I thought I had to go to the dentist afterwards. It was rocking around so much you could barely hold your drink because everything was shaking. In China, you can stand a coin on its end at the table and it will stay up the whole way. It won't even fall over. It's so smooth. And uh, that's just a conscious decision that they made in Europe, that they're going to build this network. They made in China, they're going to build this network. We're going to do what it takes. Here, how long has it been just trying to get a high-speed line in California and they can't even get that built for under something like $100 billion? We're doing transportation. We've so screwed that up. That's a great rant. Happy to give you the mic for that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, but the flying, you're absolutely right. When Treehugger, the website I write for, got bought by a big American company, they said, you know, come meet the new boss. And I flew while I was in my exercise for the year. And I used up five weeks budget worth of carbon in a 36 hour trip. Wow. So, you know, the flying is the biggest one. They're working on better fuel. They're working on electric planes for short hops. You don't know whether it's all greenwashing, where they're just saying, we're doing this. So don't worry, something's coming. But the better way to do it would just be to start building some really fast trains on dedicated tracks. Okay, should we touch on consumer goods? Well, I did my biggest bit already on consumer goods when I talked about my Apple products. But the same rule goes for everything that it does for that. You know, don't get seduced by the shiny new. Yes, I'm sure that iPhone 13 is better than my iPhone 11, but this has the best camera I've ever had. It's got the capacity I need. I don't see myself having to replace it for a long time. We just did 
by a new dishwasher. It's very interesting that when I'm talking about things that last, when I renovated my house a few years ago, six years ago now, I bought all this Samsung stuff and it was terrible. You know, if the stove didn't work, they'd have to replace all of the electronics in it. Uh, I had so much trouble and the dishwasher never worked well at all. So this time I did exactly what I talked about. I went to all of the different websites that evaluate, you know, wire cutter of the New York Times and consumers reports and everything like that. And I said, I am not thinking about money. I am thinking about service calls and durability. How long do they last? And ended up buying a really expensive Bosch it's again, you know, all of this favors the rich. You know, it favors the people who are willing to spend $1,500 in a dishwasher instead of $600 in the dishwasher. They're the people who won't have to replace it in five years. Yeah, long term, it's cheaper. You'd have to do the homework and find out what lasts. The other thing that I totally neglected in my book, because, you know... I'm an architect of a certain age, and architects all wear black, and so I've never had to buy new clothes in the last 10 years, really. But clothing is huge. Clothing is absolutely uh, the length of time that it lasts, the carbon that goes into it, the amount of waste in clothing is staggering. On this C40 city study that I looked at, that the waste from clothing for people who live in cities was higher than the consumption for transit. They were buying enough clothes, throw away fast fashion or whatever, that it had a higher carbon footprint than taking the subway did. Wow. I was surprised at the statistics. It's the same thing that is applied to everything else that we've talked about, which is the rule of sufficiency. What do we really need? Once we have it, how can we make it last? How can we fix it instead of buying new? How can we treat it carefully so it doesn't wear out as quickly? The lens of life that I try and look through in all of this now is that word sufficiency. Is it enough? And that's more important than the word everybody used for years, which is efficiency. You know, build a big efficient house or a smaller sufficient house, you'll find the sufficient one had less material went into it and cost less to operate. And in the end, you'll be a lot happier with it because how much space do you need? Yeah. When you were describing the size of your house being divided in half, I was thinking, oh, wow, that's a lot less cleaning that you probably have to do. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. <laughs> It's true. Yeah, in fact, you wrote that we don't have to actually change that much to live the one and a half degree lifestyle because a lifestyle based on sufficiency isn't, it's not like sacrifice. It isn't about doing without. It's about using less, about using better, making that modal shift to alternatives is what you wrote. Well, my favorite story that I think summarizes the whole picture and once I used to love going to the ski club three hours north and driving three hours, getting electrically winched up the hill to go down artificial snow that's made with electricity and water pump from the lake and then driving three hours back. And last winter and this winter, I would strap my cross-country skis to my electric bike and I would go to the big park and cross-country ski around. And, you know, I got more exercise. I had more fun. It cost me nothing. I didn't sit five hours in a car. And it was wonderful. So nobody is, can say, I'm not having as good a life. I'm giving something up. I'm just making choices to do things differently that are just as much fun and often more healthy and often a lot cheaper. Yeah, that's a great summary. And I, I really loved reading your book, Lloyd, and I I would recommend it to our listeners for sure. So we'll make sure we link to it and help people find that book if they want to read it as well. I wanted to know a little bit about what the reaction to your book has been. And there was also, a, I think, a pilot study with various participants trying to do exactly what you did, the 1.5 degree lifestyle. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, first with about the reaction to the book, it's been muted. I have had a lot of people, they say love it. I have not had one negative review of anyone who 
read it. I've heard from a lot of people who just refuse to read it because they just don't believe the thesis in the first place, that it's all oil companies responsible for everything and your personal actions don't matter, which you know is a story that's been going around forever. So I think I've been saved the criticism because people have been pre-selecting not to read the book. <laughs> Other than that, or it's just a very good book. With respect to the pilot study, I had based my book on uh, some work done in Finland, which then became uh, updated with a group called hotorcool.org. You can look it up. And then a group of us, me and people from hotorcool.org and some others got a grant and basically redid my spreadsheet in a much more elaborate form. It takes some time to figure out how to do it. The biggest problem with it is it accounts for all the embodied carbon. Uh. So you have to go around your house and do a list of all the things you have. But once you do that, it's fairly easy to use. And we put out a call for volunteers from around the world. And we had 40 people who said they would do it. And in the end, only 16 did. Uh, finished it. And in the end, too, they found that some people didn't have a hard time because they lived in cities and they didn't have to change that much. And a lot of them are in Europe where they're starting from a lower base anyways. And some in Africa, you know, they didn't have to do anything. They were already living it because half of the world does live on to less than 2.5 tons a year and they were doing it. But others just found, well, I have to drive. I don't have a choice. I mean, that's how I get everywhere because of where I live and I can't give that up and I'm not going to buy an e-bike for this exercise. So in the end, as a pilot, it was useful, but I'd love to do it again. I'd love to have the spreadsheet turned into a simple app. Like if you look at My Fitness Pal or a lot of exercise apps, they're really easy to use with drop down menus and things like that. And the next thing I'd like to do is to make this elaborate spreadsheet actually convert into something that's relatively easy to use. And I think we'll have much better results then. But if you'll put the link into 15.org, people can go and download it. Uh, it's free. It's accessible and try it themselves. If they get through the instructions, they might enjoy it, <laughs> but they're tough. <laughs> if you can do that, does that mean you're obsessive compulsive? Do you have to be a little OC to pull it off right now <laughs> because you don't have the simple app? I think so. I mean, <laughs> I've been using this MyFitnessPal app where I was tracking what I eat, my caloric count, pretty regularly for the last couple of years. And so it didn't seem a switch just to use a different calculator. But some people I know they get these apps for fitness and they last a week or they skip every day. Oh, I ate that. I can't put that in there. Somebody, my computer will know that I had a piece of cake. So it's a certain type of person who will do it and a certain kind will find it too hard. But it's a much better way than those all the carbon calculators they see that they just say, how many people in your house and how do you drive a year and that, which are so general. Yeah. I like to get down to the minutiae. Well, we should have set this up and pitched it to you, Lloyd, as a five-part series. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to do some editing here. <laughs> There's so much more we could talk about, too. Yeah. But I'm wondering if we're ready to reluctantly close this part of the conversation and head to Honey, I Shrunk the Footprint, which I forgot to keep you around for last time. Oh. So I think we should move on to Honey, I Shrunk My Footprint. Let's do it. And this is the segment where we share something that we have done recently or do regularly to shrink our footprint that we just think is worth talking about because it's unusual or funny or quirky or we're proud of it or we think people might want to adopt it. And we figured you would be the king <laughs> of that segment. Happily. You could do that with half your brain tied behind your back. Okay. So you can choose to go first or you can choose to go third if you want to see how we do it. I'll go third. Okay. I can start, but I actually, I took a, a different tact than usual. I decided to do more of a meta analysis of my carbon footprint because this book really inspired me. And so I went to the Global Footprint Network calculator and it's exactly what you just described is not specific enough to really do a good job for this sort of exercise. But for me, I think it gives me a very directional sense of my carbon footprint. And I did this back for my 2019 emissions. So pre-pandemic, 
I did quite a few business trips around the world, pleasure trips. I had 132 hours of flying that year. Yeah. (laughs) I drove very little because I lived in the city and I took public transit to work, but I was just flying. It was the most flying I've ever done. Let me guess. Let me guess. Sure. Uh, Your footprint came in at 35 tons. So no, it came in at 19 tons. With all that flying. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, I think it goes back to your point of data sources. I don't know what the Global Footprint Network uses for their emissions data, but 19 tons of carbon was the result. And then the other thing that it it actually looks at your ecological footprint. So more than just carbon. Right. Water. and What resources are you using for food and yeah, shelter, that kind of thing. And so it tells you if everyone on the planet had your same lifestyle, how many planet Earths would we need? And mine was 5.4 Earths. Yeah. I was going to estimate six, but 19 is not possible yeah. because the average American is 17. And you to do that much time in the air? Well, the fact that she wasn't driving. That, yeah, she wasn't driving, of course. Like that's in the top 10%. The driving is bigger because they're doing a lot. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So anyway, I just did it again for my 2021 behavior. So during a pandemic and working from home and just very different lifestyle in 2021, I flew a total of 15 hours, but I drove 5,500 miles because I I did do a long road trip. And that came back with 7.2 tons of carbon for the year. Which is fantastic. Everybody had a great carbon year. Yeah. The global emissions were down 6% because of it all. Yeah, but even at that rate, three Earths would be required if everyone had my lifestyle. Right. So we'll link to this footprint network calculator. Lloyd, I think you mentioned the data might be kind of wonky, but at least for me, it's directional. And it still shows me, even if I'm at seven tons now, to get to 2.5, that's a lot more things that I need to start looking at and working on. So I thought that that was an interesting sort of meta-analysis of my (laughs) carbon (laughs) Right. That's interesting. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. I have one that I think is kind of fun. So uh, even though uh, the listeners are just listening to this podcast, we can see each other while we're recording this. So I want to say to you guys, look at the shirt I'm wearing. The collar is really getting frayed. I don't know if you can tell. It used to be that I might wear this around the house, but I would have changed into a shirt that isn't ragged if I was going to be seen out in public or even if I was going to be on a Zoom meeting. And I used to discard or donate a shirt as soon as the collar or the sleeves started to get kind of ratty. And I've thought about this. And the main reason I did that was I didn't want people to look at me and think, oh, he's poor. He must not be successful. I saw a cartoon in an issue of Yes Magazine that came out this last summer that kind of made me realize that I really should be wearing clothes like this as a badge of honor. Uh, I should be proud of the fact that I don't throw it away or donate it. Donating is, you know, of very marginal value, if any value at all these days. I should be proud of the fact that I'm not throwing it away. It still serves its purpose. And I shouldn't be so worried about the signs of my success in my clothing. Now, I'm lucky that it takes a long time for my clothes to fray because I religiously never put my clothes in the dryer. I always hang them. So they last a long time. But now I've decided to turn over a new leaf. And today is the first day that I've gotten on a Zoom call where I would have worn a shirt like this that (laughs) makes me look poor. (laughs) It doesn't make (laughs) me look poor. It makes me look like a good global citizen, I think. (laughs) I got um, hired recently to do a talk about this exact subject, living the 1.5 degree lifestyle to one of Canada's largest banks. Mm. And I'm doing this next week where I'm going to two bankers' homes to tell them how to do this. And I know where these houses are. And these are seriously rich people in big houses. And I think it's going to be fun. And, you know, (laughs) I just told them I'm not wearing a suit. (laughs) I grew up, you know, I used to wear suits for banks and funerals, the only two things, and I don't fit in my suits, I don't <laughs> think. And they said, oh, okay. But like, you know, the, I used to do the same thing when I was in real estate development. I'm in the clothes and the suits and the shoes, and uh, you don't need that, certainly in this day and age. I wish I could be a fly on the wall for your conversation, Lloyd. That might be a little awkward. (laughs) Yes. I think it's going to be interesting. I'll show up on my e-bike and march in. (laughs) 
For me, I think the thing I used to buy tons and tons of books. You can see behind me on the camera there, sort of like the architecture books there. And my wife hasn't bought a book in years because she's the biggest supporter of our fabulous local library system. And so she's got 50 books out at any given time uh, from the library. And I've really gotten into ebooks now. I don't think I bought a paper book in two years. Wow. And it's a big saving in carbon. And they've done studies. They say, well, how much are you using your iPad for? And how long does your iPad last? Yeah. And of course, I want you all to buy the paper version of the living the <laughs> 1.5 degree lifestyle. But um, it's one of those things that uh, I just don't want to do anymore, not just because of the carbon, but also because living in a much smaller space, I don't have anywhere to put them. And cutting down trees and shipping them around the world to turn them into books is big. How do you feel? Do you do ebooks or do you paper books? That's a great one. I do mostly library books. Ah, well, that's the best of all. That's by far the best of all. I just need to make sure I don't drive to the library. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really guilty. I hate reading on a screen. I really love reading a hard copy. And I really think I've got this great library that in a post-apocalyptic world where uh, we don't have the energy to run our Kindles, that it might be nice if Dave Gardner has this library that somebody can leaf through. It's a very good point. You've done the calculus to determine that there's no way that the power to run the devices it comes anywhere close to competing with the carbon footprint of producing those books. No, not even close. But then again, that's why the library is the best thing, because the book gets printed and then it gets read by dozens, hundreds of people possibly. And of course, that just divides that footprint for that book happens just once. Yeah, that's a great point there. Well, thank you, Lloyd, for participating in our Honey, I Shrunk My Footprint <laughs> segment and for talking to us for two episodes. This has been just so eye-opening for me personally, and I'm really excited for our listeners to hear all of your data. <laughs> that's really powerful. Yeah, I've really enjoyed it. And I'll send you the links to three things that you might want to put up on the site. The 15.org calculator is a very interesting new site. Did I mention it last time? The Jump, an English website. Yes. Did you look at it? That looks very cool. Yeah. And it's all based on that C40 report rather than the hot or cool report and that and the uh, C40 urban living thing. And it's very cool. And they just put out new stuff this week. Well, I think these are a couple of our best episodes. Oh. So thanks for sharing what you've learned. You did a lot of hard work. A pleasure. Okay, quick note. We know we're running long, so we're going to skip growth-busting news and listener feedback and all that. So thanks for hanging out with us through that entire conversation. A very important one. There is one little note I want to add, and that is, you know, in his book, there is a great list of top actions you can do at the end of each section what we eat, how we live, how we move, and consumer goods. If you don't even read the whole book, which isn't that long a read, you want those lists. Absolutely. I'm going to keep it on my bedside table, even though I've read it, just to refer back to it every once in a while. Try some new things. It's a great idea. Get out those refrigerator magnets. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in. Uh, as usual, you can learn more about the issues we discuss in this podcast at growthbusters.org. That homepage is also where you can donate or get on our email list. And if you think this podcast is important, share the podcast with people you know uh, that could benefit from learning about some of these topics. Subscribe to the podcast and uh, don't forget to call in. Give us some feedback. You can reach us at podcast at growthbusters.org. Or call the hotline at 719-402-1400 and leave us a message. I also want to thank Jake Fader for writing and producing the Growth Busters theme that you hear at the open and close of this podcast, and Carlos Jones for singing it. See you next time. Some may dream to paint mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a Growth Buster. Some may just want more, but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a Growth Buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather. But no, not us. We are the growth busters.